Good evening, everyone. I'm David Elwood. I'm Dean of the Howard Kennedy School. It's my very great honor to welcome all of you um, and welcome General Odierno here to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Kennedy School. Um, General, welcome to Harvard. Um, we are very, very proud to have you here. You certainly have our enduring respect and gratitude, uh, not only for your uh, commitment and your service and your sacrifice, but also because you have the opportunity to lead the remarkable group of people that you do, and including many here that are in the audience. And I'd also like to recognize the unique service and sacrifice of those who serve or have served in our military. So if you could just raise your hands, if you're a current or former uh, service member, and I'd like to give all of you give a big hand. We are very fortunate to have so many uh, members of the Armed Forces and um, veterans here at the Kennedy School as part of our student body in, in various re uh, respects. I'd also like to uh, certainly acknowledge the Institute of Politics uh, and particularly IOP fellow Emma Skye, who is right here, uh, for, who played such an important role in organizing this event and for your many uh, good deeds beyond here. So let me say a little bit about this evening's speaker. Uh, General, General Odiono uh, currently serves as Commander U.S. Joint Forces Command, which is located in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, which focuses on supp supporting current operations while shaping U.S. forces. He's a native of New Jersey, um, and he graduated from the U.S. Military Academy in West Point in 1976, uh, a commission in field artillery. He also has a master's degree in nuclear effects engineering and national security strategy from North Carolina State University and the Naval War College. Do note, U.S. Military Academy uh, at West Point and the Naval War College. Uh, remarkable combination. Um, he has commanded units at every echelon, from platoon to theater, with duty in Germany, Albania, Kuwait, Iraq, and of course the United States. And he, uh, as is common, has moved back and forth between operational and advisory roles of various sorts, but his advisory roles have often been with the Secretary of State uh, and very, very senior folks, Secretary, for example, Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. From 2001 to 2004, he commanded the 4th Infantry Division. He led the 4th Infantry uh, during Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, and during which time it was uh, his soldiers who captured former President uh, Saddam Hussein near Tikrit in December 2003. Uh, well done, General. Um, he was also in Iraq in December 2006 to 2008, where he was really the, architect, the operational architect for the surge. He most, frequent, most recently commanded the multinational force uh, in Iraq and then U.S. Forces Iraq from September 2008 uh, to 2010. He has truly been at all sides of the, uh, at the center of our uh, uh, attempts and challenges to uh, bring a different, uh, different set of opportunities and a different future uh, for Iraq and that part of the world. Um, and during his tour, he drew up the plan for the, also for the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq and oversaw the transition from surge to stability operations. It was the largest redeployment of forces and equipment in 40 years. His awards and decorations can partly be seen here, um, but there are too many to mention. Uh, he's received, however, the highest award in the State Department, the Secretary of State Distinguished Service Award, many others, including one you might not ordinarily expect. Recently, the Romanian president awarded General Odierno the Romanian Order of Military Merit. He received the 2009 Naval War College Distinguished Graduate Leadership Award for his strategic insight and leadership. So, he is a remarkable public servant, a military leader, and a citizen. But he has one other talent, which many people uh, did not know until it actually occurred. And that is, he is apparently a semi-professional semi barber. You can see he does his own hair. Um, having shaved the head of Stephen uh, Colbert uh, on the Colbert Report on live national TV. You will not see me standing particularly close to the general uh, during, this, uh, during this talk. Um, it is truly an honor uh, to have uh, the general here with us this evening. So without further ado, General, Ro general Ray Odierno. Dean Elwer, thank you so much. I appreciate the kind introduction and for the invitation to have a chance to speak to such a great group of men and women. 
I was a little nervous when I first found I was coming here, uh, but it wasn't because I'm a four-star general and because I'm facing a group that will probably ask me some very difficult questions about the future. It's because I was afraid to leak out that I'm a lifelong Yankees fan. <laughs> and that my son actually works for the New York Yankees, so I was worried I might not make it here, actually. <laughs> As the police were escorting me, I told them this, and they kind of got the look in their faces, okay, I guess we'll still let them go through and let them go there. So I'm glad I finally made it. I count it a privilege to visit an institution named in the honor of a great American, President John F. Kennedy. I don't have to tell you this, but as we all know, President Kennedy was a Harvard man, a decorated naval officer in the Second World War. And I know how proud he is of his military service and how proud he is of his alma mater and was. And I certainly believe that today he's extremely happy as we proudly welcome the fact that Harvard is welcoming back the Navy ROTC program. And I want to congratulate Harvard for doing that. <clears throat> American history, as we all know, has deep roots literally in the rocky soil of New England and on the commons of Boston and Cambridge. Our nation's military in particular grew from hard-fought battles waged within a day's march of this form. And many, many Harvard graduates have sacrificed greatly in our nation's wars. This university has also been a vital contributor to our nation's soft power. Through its international reputation as a center of academic excellence. So I'm very pleased to be among you all this evening. And I certainly look forward to sharing with you my perspective but more importantly, gaining your perspective during questions and answers, which I look forward to. My perspective is informed by my core belief. I believe in the value of service, selfless dedication to a cause greater than oneself. I believe that service is an essential characteristic of a good citizen and the most essential characteristic of a good leader. Leaders succeed when they aspire others to service aimed at solving difficult problems, overcoming hard challenges, improving our communities, and upholding the ideals of our country. So in or out of uniform, in government or in business, in the science or in the arts, I believe that selfless service through leadership is a high calling, an incredible opportunity to do something greater, to, greater than yourself and also to make a difference in others' lives. So understanding big challenges and moving toward real solutions are clearly among the worthy goals of this forum. With that in mind, I want to describe my view of the overall global strategic environment and discuss what sort of leadership I believe is necessary to guide us into an immensely complex and interconnected future. We've all heard the term globalization. To some degree, it's been underway for centuries, but the late 20th century communications technologies accelerated it, and scholars have now labeled it. But whatever we choose to call the rapid worldwide movement of ideas, commerce, and people, it is a driving factor in the strategic environment that we live. And because of globalization, the strategic environment is in a state of flux. The environment is changing in historically unprecedented, nonlinear ways. We're seeing a changing distribution of power, both in terms of the type of power and those who have the power. The strategic environment is changing in other ways, too. Rather than rigid blocks of the 20th century competing primarily on the basis of security, we now see a multinodal construct of fluid coalitions based on combined interests of economics, diplomacy, ideology, and in some cases, military power. The strategic environment is also affected by the clear demo demographic trend toward a more youthful, urbanized world. Additionally, the relationship between prosperity and security is particularly important today in light of our own economic challenges. Emerging conventional and non-conventional powers, those we call non-state actors, pose a potential hybrid threat to security, while also competing for resources, markets, and ideas. All of this plays out in what we call the global commons, 
which has been known in the past as land, sea, and air. But over the last decades, we've added space to the global commons, and I would argue today that we must add cyberspace to the global commons. The concept of a hybrid threat describes the increased complexity of the environment in which any adversary, state or non-state actor, may use. He will use a mix of conventional weapons, irregular tactics, criminal behavior, or even terrorism to achieve their objectives. Hybrid threats taking advantage of space and cyberspace will be much more fluid and elusive than the relatively static threats posed by historical adversaries restricted to the land, sea, or air. I want to specifically talk about two key geographic regions, the broader Middle East and Asia, and highlight the complexity of our present day environment. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the obvious in the context of globalization. No region of the world should be considered in isolation. That is true for the Arctic or Latin America as it is for the Middle East or Asia. But the latter two are clearly instructive to us. Constituting a wide swath from Morocco in the west to Afghanistan and Pakistan in the east, the broader Middle East is a nexus of every key strategic challenge. The demographic trend toward a large youthful urban population is especially strong here. Combine this demographic with massive joblessness, limited social freedom, and exposure via modern media to the gulf that divides its citizens from the most prosperous regions of the world, and the gulf dividing them from their governments. And you have, with these two things, a recipe for change or unrest. Factor in natural resources, and you understand why conventional powers are always attempting to influence events in the region. In many cases, that influence has been biased in favor of short or medium-term access to extract resources or security guarantees instead of paying long-term attention to underlying drivers of instability. It's also a region which, which have significant number of weak or failed states, such as Yemen and Somalia, which have become fertile ground for malign and non-state actors to exploit for their own means and goals and objectives. Yet I believe there are some hopeful signs in the Middle East too. I do believe Iraq is moving forward as a young democracy. With sustained commitment by the United States and other partners, I believe Iraq could become an enduring strategic partner and a force for stability in the region. What we're seeing in the popular uprisings around the Middle East is not just a general plea for liberty and economic opportunity, but a narrative that directly competes with the violent theocratic vision espoused by extremist groups such as Al-Qaeda. And in my mind, these voices are strong. And the outcome could be significant. Current events in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya are dynamic and of diverse origin. And they illustrate the complexity of the environment that we're involved with, influenced by all the elements of globalization and playing out in the global commons. In fact, playing out at the speed of Twitter. How Egypt in particular emerges from this revolution is extremely important, I believe, to the United States and our relationships throughout the Middle East. Asia is where we see the greatest shifts in the balance of power, not only toward Asia, but within Asia. India and China are examples of emerging conventional powers exerting massive economic influence and building modern military capability with some of their wealth. And within Asia, the balance has tilted away from Japan as the preeminent economic power. Nevertheless, India and China face significant demographic and economic challenges internally, as their vast populations per capita are, and their per capita income are still poor by comparison to both Japan and the United States. As with oversimplifying the nature of the Middle East popular uprisings, we arbitrarily group these diverse Asian nations at our own peril. India is the world's largest democracy with a relatively balanced economy. China is the world's largest authoritarian regime 
with a heavily export-based economy. In both cases, our relationships will probably play out very differently, but a long and often fine line between competition and cooperation. In a region where we historically engage bilaterally, we are now seeing increasingly find emerging multilateral security initiatives, such as the ASEAN Regional Forum and the Six-Party Talks on North Korea. These arrangements, are, these arrangements are clearly less tidy and more difficult and more complicated, but important in keeping all of the key regional players engaged on peaceful terms. Of course, our North American homeland is part of the global commons. We are tied by culture, trade, and treaties to other regions, and our own challenges are significant. While direct threats from conventional powers are unlikely, we face increased threats from non-state actors, such as terrorists and drug cartels. And our greatest current challenge, indeed, a threat is economic. Our resource-constrained environment demands budget discipline and requires experienced leaders of every ilk to make different, difficult choices to ensure our long-term prosperity, influence, and security around the world. And all leaders must understand that and work towards those goals. Today's complex world requires much more of our leaders. It's not enough to be te technically or operationally proficient in the military. We must be able to assess, understand, adapt, and yet still be decisive. We have to think through complex, multi-dimensional problems, taking into account the diplomatic, economic, military, political, and cultural implications of our actions. This applies equally to our military and civilian leaders, though. Recent experience suggests a couple of key attributes for successful leadership today. First, it's absolutely essential that our leaders, from elected officials to military officers to private sector business people, aggressively pursue an understanding of the strategic environment around them. As President Kennedy stated so clearly, leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. As leaders, we must understand the interlocking fabric of our environment. For example, the combined effect of borderless internet cyber commons and revolutionary liberal ideas shared among people who want something better in their lives than authoritarian governments and economic stagnation. The next step is building the relationships necessary to foster our own and others' understanding. We must circulate outside of our comfort zone, get to know people we don't look like or speak like. We must look at things from others' perspectives. And if I'm preaching to the choir here, then we have to seek out people from the other choir. Their second key attribute of a successful leader is crea creating unity of effort among diverse stakeholders. Unity of effort is leadership by multiplication, achieving results far in excess of one stakeholder's capacity. We value this very highly, and we've learned very hard lessons in the military over the last 10 years. We've taken this approach in recent operations around the world and codified it most recently in the Chairman's National Military Strategy. But the military is just one component and one instrument of our national power. It's not our military firepower alone, but our capacity to facilitate the many non-military instruments of national power and to enable our allies and partners that should help us tip the scales in our strategic favor. For me personally, the greatest challenge I've faced as a leader was commanding General of Multinational Corps Iraq during the surge in 2007. There's no greater privilege for an officer than to lead soldiers in combat. But it also carries with it great responsibility. I sought advice from those with, with a range of experiences and expertises, so as I could better understand the nature of the power struggle going on inside of Iraq that was clearly driving an increase in violence. We then developed a strategy in order to fill this gap that had been established inside of Iraq and separate those who were reconcilable from those who would never be reconcilable. 
and we designed a plan to push U.S. forces back out into the population centers to protect the Iraqi people. In doing so, we helped to lower the violence in the country and pave the way for all of Iraq's communities to participate in the political process. But it came at a heavy cost in terms of the lives of our soldiers under my command. I learned many lessons in Iraq, not least the limits of military power and the importance of soft power and the value of allies to gain unity of effort to solve complex problems. Historically, we have stated that our military's ultimate responsibility is to fight and win our nation's wars. However, it's no longer that simple. We must provide a range of op op options to our president, array of tools and capabilities with which to respond adaptively to a variety of situations in concert with our non-military partners to achieve the president's policy objectives. Many of these tools must be used in situations far short of war. We still will maintain our tools of lethal force, but only as an option, not as necessarily the only option. But if that is perceived as our only recourse, events will tend to be self-fulfilling. The utility of force is greatest when part of our broad array of options from which the president may choose, then it becomes more effective. Given current resource constraints, now more than ever, we must work collaboratively to find solutions to our toughest challenges and to put those solutions into practice. Successful leaders must recognize this fact and act selflessly for the common achievement of our national goals. It doesn't matter who gets the credit. It matters only that we compete and win honorably and ethically as a nation. I appreciate the work of institutions such as Harvard and, this, and specifically this forum toward the goal of informing and inspiring us all to serve. When we participate in collegial debate of ideas that challenge our assumptions and allow us to appreciate the complexity of our world, we are inspired to develop ways to improve it. Thus inspired, it's up to all of us to act. It's up to all of us to take some risk and enter the arena of service to our country or community. And more than that, to take up the responsibilities of leadership. In closing, a survey of the global strategic environment su suggests to me that on one hand, there are countless challenges to be met. And on the other hand, countless ways in which individual leaders can make a difference. Technology, policies, and processes are merely tools to enable such efforts. It's people. Citizens like you who do the thinking, set the goals, make the decisions, and put words and ideals into action. And I'm certain that many great acts of service and leadership will come forth from everyone in this room today. And I ask you all to dedicate yourself to the greater good. For that, you have my thanks and my respect. And I have only one last request before I leave. Over the next several months as you're going around, having the opportunity to study and to do many of the things that you enjoy, always think about those military and civilian entities that are deployed around the world attempting to bring peace and security to everyone. I ask you never to have them leave your mind and your thoughts as you move forward and continue to press yourself and push yourself here at the institution. Dean, again, thank you so much for listening, and I'm looking forward to all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General. We do obviously have time for questions. I just, uh, there are microphones right here right up there, another microphone up there, and a final one over here. We'll just go in order. Um, I just want to remind you what a good question is. Uh, first, you identify yourself. Second, it is short, containing just one thought. And third is it ends with a question mark. And uh, with those rules, we'll start right here. 
John Reedy from the Shorenstein uh, Media Center. Uh, General, thank you for being with us. This, uh, let's just assume this is hypothetical and uh, technical rather than political, but uh, assume tonight that the Arab League and uh, NATO agree to accept uh, uh, the rebel leader Abdul Jalal's uh, request for a no-fly zone. Um, the two questions uh, are related. Sorry, Dave. Um, how, how long would it take to impose that, and uh, would it be possible to bring tanks, anti-aircraft equipment in? How long would it take to do that? Well, first, uh, the way you preface your question is good, because the, what we don't want is to have unilateral action by the United States and Libya. We want it to be part of something greater, I believe. Uh, we can react very quickly to all of this. Uh, if we have to. Uh, we're prepared to do that. Uh, I believe within, you know, a couple days, we'd probably be able to implement a no-fly zone. Uh, to bring in, a, bring in heavy equipment, that's a whole different kind of escalation. I'm not sure we're quite there yet. I'm not sure uh, how willing we'd be to do that. Uh, but if we had to, we could do that probably within a week or so. Um, but I think the real key piece of Libya, I would just point out that I think it's important that this, there has to be international action against Libya. And I think that's the key piece of all this. And then within that framework, we'll decide with all the other contributing nations what we will contribute and how we can best support the effort inside of Libya. I would just say, and that Dean and I were talking earlier, you know, I believe Libya is going to be a long-term effort. This is not going to be something, people might think it might end tomorrow. Uh, but I think this will go on for a very long time, and how we intervene and who intervenes will be very important. And so I think it's something that has to be carefully thought through as we move forward. Right up here. All right. Thank you so much, General Odierno. My name is Stephanie Lewis. I'm a senior undergrad at Harvard. And I was curious, what role do you think that nanotechnology will play in the future for national security, specifically with regard to DARPA and ARPA-E? Well, I'm not sure I'm completely familiar with everything that DARPA is doing. Uh, but one of the things that we have to continue to uh, encourage is technologies. And frankly, what we're learning actually, which gets away a little bit from DARPA, we still have to be able to do it, but it's commercial off-the-shelf entities that we can use. Because if we can do that, it becomes a hell of a lot cheaper. And, and sometimes the technology in commercial realms is so far ahead of what we have uh, working with the military, we have to take advantage of that. However, there are some key technologies that are only being developed solely for military application, and those we have to continue to fund. But these are the kind of things that we have to take a look at. With the budget constraints and with the resources that we think we'll be reducing here in the next three to four years, uh, we have to be smart about how, how we do this. We always look for ways for technology to move us forward. That gives us our advantage because we have the, the individuals that can use advanced technology and we have the capability to develop it that keeps us ahead. But what we, what we have to be careful of is developing something that we're not sure we really need. And that's the challenge that we have to do as we go through making these types of decisions. Thank you. Right up here. Thank you for coming and speaking with us. I'm a second year master's candidate here at the Kennedy School. And we spend a lot of time thinking about some of the new technologies available online. We've spent a lot of time looking at Twitter and what it's done in the Middle East and how to do communications and integrate it. And here you speak about it as a tool in some ways, but you also address cyberspace as, an, as a domain where you can work and operate. How do you think about the dual nature of that relationship and which ways you want to use it on? And where in the military do you see the strongest leadership on answering some of the untangling some of the questions about what the internet is and how we use it in a military sense. Well, f first I would just say is we have no choice. We have to use it. We have to be involved in it because it's not going away. Uh, you know, one of, my, one of the things we talk about a lot in Iraq was I would believe we were being extremely successful on the ground. But what happens is both th there's, there's terrorist organizations and others who portray something entirely different through the internet, and they're able, and that's what people believe. They believe what they're able to see and hear. And so we have to figure out how to do this. We have to figure out how we're going to operate. We have to figure out internationally, what kind of, are we, going to, are we going to regulate it? So I would argue that the internet is ungoverned terrain. 
right now. You know, we talk about ungoverned terrain um, and, you know, it, with, with lack of governments, but we, we have ungoverned terrain, I believe, uh, in the Internet. So do we want to govern it or not? I'm not saying we have to. I'm saying do we want to? And how do we do that? And so that's the things we've got to kind of look at. We also have to look at how we protect ourselves uh, because of attacks, cyber attacks. We have to figure out how we use that to uh, help us in the future, potentially, and do it within some legal framework. Those are all the things that we have to start talking about and thinking about. But we have to recognize it, that it's there. We have to understand what's going on in the realm. You have to have, a, you have, to have an understanding of what, what's being said, uh, how is it impacting people, and then we also have to understand how we might think about using it in the future. Do you want to follow that up? I could tell you do. Communications tools we've used. I know that, I, I hate to do this, but Noah Shockman of Wired says to speak of cyber war is like to speak of bayonet war in yeah. the sense that it's not in any particular way new from other developments that we've seen. I think there's probably an argument against that, and I'd love to hear if you have some way in talking about how it's novel. Well, I mean, I mean in terms of of how we use cyber? Or? Well, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's lots of, the problem we have, here's the problem. We have lots of novel ideas about the internet. The issue is, are they legal? There's a whole legal issue here that we have to deal with. And contrary to popular belief, we actually try to abide by the laws as we do things in, uh, in some cases. But, you know, it's a very difficult issue. You know, and so, so there's, there's influence operations. You know, do you want to try to influence people's thoughts through the internet? You know, how do you use it to do that? Is it legal to do that? Can we do that? You know, are there, are there ways for us to um, potentially impact um, access? It's always about access. Can we limit access or gain more access for us? And there's ways to do it. So, I mean, that's kind of where we're headed. But, you know, it's a very difficult line. And we're just scratching the surface of all of this. We've just established a cyber command in, in, the, in the military. And they're taking on these really tough issues. Uh, but we're just beginning. And we're just scratching the surface. So thanks. Thank you. My name is Richard Solomon. I'm a citizen of Boston. Uh, I uh, note that uh, you were a classmate of the recently retired Stan McChrystal. Yes. Uh, I don't have any affiliation with Rolling Stone magazine, but I do uh, want to try to draw you to talk about the uh, human nature in the 37 years that you've served in the military, uh, and specifically on the tensions between the Sunni, the Shia, and the Kurds in Iraq, and why you might believe that they could ever not fall into civil war and have a government. And by the same token, the recent statements by Hamid Karzai of Afghanistan uh, dissing the United States, not accepting our apology for killing nine yeah. young men, and also touch on when we support someone like uh, Mubarak in Egypt until, whoops, he's not going to be there, I guess we support the people. Those kind of things trouble me. Uh, when General Petraeus was here, he, he spoke about those things, and I'd like yeah, to hear what you sure. think. Thank you. A couple things. One is, uh, let, me, let me start out with uh, long-term relationships with somebody like uh, Mubarak. Again, the, the complexity of the international environment is, 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 is incredibly difficult. And what we have to be able to do is we, we form partnerships sometimes of what we think is in our best natural interest. And, and sometimes we find that short and midterm partnerships might not be the long-term solution. You know, for many years with Mubarak, I was with Secretary Rice a couple times when she went to meet with him. And every time she went to meet with him, she passed a very strong message. We want to be your partner. We want to continue to work with you. But you've got to begin reforms. But he just he never would do it. He just would not do it. He just felt he was so strong that he couldn't do this. The other thing I've learned over the last couple of years is about sovereignty. And, and what we have to do is understand nation's sovereignty. And so we have to... We have to try to interact with these nations, respecting their own sovereignty as well as they respecting our sovereignty. And that makes it more difficult to deal with individuals like Mubarak. But there are, uh, you know, there are, uh, we have agreements with nations that are good for both of us. I think that's how that started. But again, 
The argument would be we didn't follow through hard enough when he didn't execute these reforms that we see. In terms of Sunni, Shia, Kurds, um, first off, one of the things I learned very quickly is we didn't understand the underlying fabrics of the issues inside of Iraq when we got there. We didn't understand, we didn't understand the 30 years of, of war that had gone on before this and the internal issues that occurred between Sunnis and Shias, but also intra-Shia, intra-Sunni, Arab and Kurd issues. And so w that's what caused us problems. We didn't understand the problems that have, been, that have been festering for a very, very long time. But I would say this. The thing about Iraq that I take away from Iraq is they are first nationalists. And ultimately, I believe that will win out, even though they still have mistrust because of the, of the years of dictatorship they live under, under Saddam Hussein. I think they, can, they will learn to come through, with, through that. And I think the Sunni and Shia can work together. Uh, the, the government that's been formed, the parliament, is representative of all of those elements now. That has never been the case before. So there's some progress there. That's what gives me hope that they will be able to figure this out. There's still, don't get me wrong, there are still many problems that they have yet to resolve. But we hope that they're moving towards solving that through a political way and not through violence. And we're seeing indications of that. But we'll see. And as I say, everyone, the next five years will tell us whether they're able to do that or do they revert back. And I can't give you an answer yet which way it's going to go, although I believe they're heading in the right direction. Yeah, uh, yeah, on, on that piece. Uh, you know, what I've learned is th there's many audiences that these leaders have. And they have, their own in, they have their own audience within their own nation that sometimes they send messages to at our expense. I learned that in Iraq many times. And it hurts. It's hard. It's difficult. And it's difficult for our population to understand that. So there's the public message that they have to send to their own constituents, and then there's messages they have to talk with us about maybe more in private and other things. And sometimes those are very difficult, especially when we're spending a lot of resources there to help them. But I think that's, that's part of the cultural piece that has to be worked through. And this is about developing relationships, and this is about using the other tools in order to make these long-term relationships as we move forward. And I think that's the issue that comes up constantly with issues like Karzai's statement about the killing of eight, eight, eight children and our not accepting our apology. Uh, we have to look at it from what that means to him internally, politically, and then how does it affect our relationship and how we work our way through it. Those are things you have to work every single day, even though it's difficult for us sometimes to understand that and, and handle that especially when we're losing the lives of our young men and women over there. I don't know, maybe I could ask you a quick question, um, which is you've been talking about, in very political terms, about nation building, a whole variety of things. Obviously, this is a very different kind of mission than many of uh, you were probably trained for and many others were. It also involves different kind of collaborations within the American government. Uh, traditionally, there's been a pretty strong uh, firewall between the military and, and civilian sectors and certainly between the military and, and other parts of the government. How is that changing nature of that mission forced you to interact in different ways with those? And even more importantly for folks here, how should we be training people differently uh, so that they really can cross those boundaries that have stood, stood for a long period of time but clearly don't stand anymore? Yeah. I mean, one of our jobs is, I, I, I will not go completely over and say one of our responsibilities in the military is nation building, but one of our responsibilities is to facilitate it, is, is to give the others the opportunity, the people who do nation building as a living, to do that and give them access and allow them the ability to attempt to do that. And in order for us to do that, we have to have, um, we have to start early in working and training and, and operating together uh, people of the State Department, people of the military, people of the United Nations, all these other groups that work constantly together so they get used to working together, understand each other. The one thing I talked about was unity of effort. And, and what, I, what I try to achieve in our leaders, what we have to do as leaders is we have to attempt to find what the common objectives are. So what I learned in Iraq is everybody has their own objectives. The U.S. has objectives. The United Nations has some objectives. Uh, other, other allies have objectives. So find what your common objectives are and work towards those. And if you can get people moving towards those common objectives, then you can gain and harness an awful lot. And we have to do that within our own government. We, we have, you know, every department has different programs and different objectives. So we have to find out where we have common 
objectives, and we have to start working together to push and learn. In institutions like this, you have to understand each other. That's the main thing I would tell you. You have to learn about the military. You have to learn about the State Department. You have to learn about the United Nations. You have to learn about the Treasury Department. You have to learn about NATO. You have to learn about all these other entities that are involved in this. And once you get an understanding of that and continue the open discussion, then maybe we can figure out how to have common ground in working through these really hard problems. And I think that's where, how I, I'm trying to encourage people to do. Right over here. General Leonardo, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Vanessa Berry, and I'm a second-year doctoral student at the Graduate School of Education. Um, and my question is, given your, the, the, your success um, in Iraq with the implementation of counterinsurgency strategy, um, will a similar uh, approach work in a country like Afghanistan? Yeah. First off, um, there are some principles that you can, you can move from Iraq to Afghanistan, but the culture and environment in Afghanistan is very different than Iraq. and so whether the exact, same, the exact same thing we did in Iraq will work in Afghanistan, it's not, it doesn't translate completely. But there's some key principles. One is, in order to be successful, you have to build a successful uh, indigenous military, because they have to ultimately take, take responsibility and take charge of their own security. So it's key to start building that, this indigenous capability. And then you have, to, you have to close the gap between what the government delivers and what the people need. And so you have to help build security, you have to help build economically, you have to help them politically and diplomatically. Because if you don't, you have these other people trying to fill the gap, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and other organizations. So what the surge hopefully will do in Afghanistan, as it did in Iraq, is it buys time for these other entities to grow while you keep the violence down. So I think that's the general piece that we have to try to do. The issue becomes, uh, the issue will ultimately become how long is it going to take us to do this? Uh, we've made some good progress, but is it enough? Are we seeing enough progress on the political and economic side? And that's what we have to continue to watch, and that's what we're trying to work through. We're now getting this, buying the time and space for those issues to start to improve there, and how long will it take them? So those are the kind of things we have to translate. Right up here. Good evening, sir. My name is Jonas Peter Aikens. I'm a first year at the business school, and from September of 2008 until August of 2009, I was the BUA Intel briefer at MNFI. <laughs> and I'm curious to know how you think, sir, about the way in which you as a leader receive information in an increasingly complex environment and the way in which you disseminate yeah. your direction once you've received and, and analyzed that it's, information. It's a great question, and I have this slide. I don't have it here, but I have a slide I've built. It's the most complex problem you have as a leader today, is how you manage information. Because just internal to your own organization, you have this incredible amount of information that's being generated every day. Uh, and then externally, you have information that impacts your operation uh, from, um, from outside organizations, from your own government, from other governments, from uh, insurgent elements, from, from NATO, from UN. And so what you have to figure out is how they interrelate to each other and what are the important pieces of information. And you have to train your staff and you have to train the people around you to try to pick out what is important. You have to do that by translating to them what your intent is, what are the things that are important to you. And you have to have constant dialogue and exchanges of dialogue in order for us to, to get the right information because there's just a plethora of information out there. First, you have to have the tools to manage it, and it's not just... It's sometimes physical tools to manage it. But secondly is to make sure everybody understands what's important to you for you to make that really difficult decision in a timely, effective manner. And so it's constant interaction. It's constant talking to people about what you believe is important. What is the information you need? Why do you need it? And when we went out, we, we drove towards a thing called drivers of instability in Iraq. And people had trouble understanding what that meant. And it wasn't necessarily violence. It was what was the underlying, underpinning causes of violence? Was it economic? Was it religious? Was it sectarian? Was it economic? You know, and, and, and so what I, what I asked everybody to do is define what your drivers of instability are in your area. And then report and give me the information on that so we can then figure out how we're going to fix that problem. So it's a really complex issue. It's becoming more complex because of the increase of information that's available to you now. 
We have this incredible capacity to gather information. The hard part is managing it and then making the decision. Right over here. My name is Dan Futrell. I'm a first year student here at uh, the Kennedy School uh, studying public policy. Uh, I've served uh, 27 months in Iraq, most of them under your command with uh, 3 2 Striker uh, and a, as an aide to uh, General Pete Bayer. Uh, my question is more internally focused. Um, now, over the last 10 years of conflict, we've seen the demographics and the uh, socioeconomic status, socioeconomic levels of those who are joining the military um, kind of diverge from the United States population as a whole. Uh, and I'm curious, you know, uh, Admiral Mullen and uh, Secretary Gates have spoken uh, quite a bit about this recently. Uh, I'm curious if you could shed some light on, a, as you personally and kind of senior, senior military leaders, how do you think about that problem and how are you thinking about, you know, how you address it and solve it? Well, it is a problem. I mean, the, the, ter the, the, the statistic we use is about 1% of the American population serves in the military. And as you go around the military entities, you'll find that it's, we're seeing more and more family members of military performing in the military. And I think that's a dangerous, dangerous precedent. Uh, it's important that we, ha we have diversity and, and, and significant amount of, of people from all walks of life in the military. And I think part of it is, I mean, as I, I talked earlier, just beginning ROTC, a place like Harvard is helpful to that. We have to start reaching out to more of those entities in order to do that. Um, but we have to change this. We have to get more people involved. And the first thing everybody talks about, then we need to go back to a draft. And I, I, I'm, not in the, in the, I'm not yet there where we have to go back to a draft. I think there's a lot of inherent positive things about an all-volunteer army. Uh, and one of the things that people don't really understand is that the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines socially leads a lot of issues uh, in integrating people, giving people opportunities. And, you know, I, I've had so many examples where I had young kids who came from an incredibly bad background. Poor, no parents, not much of an education. was able to somehow get in the Army and they leave, they stay 15 or 16 years, they get out. They get good jobs. They've learned. They've learned skills. They they are better citizens. So so it's there's a whole piece of that that we still have to continue. So so it's about how you get everyone involved in this. How do you get more people involved in understanding the military, understanding the kind of things we're trying to do, and understanding some of these social issues that we deal with on a, on a regular basis. And so we have to figure out ways to reach out better. The use of the National Guard in Iraq and Afghanistan has helped us significantly in this because that allows us to reach into communities we don't normally reach into because they're all over the United States. Uh, they're in all, all cities, towns, and, and that, that brings awareness as well, and it brings people to understand a little bit more what the military is doing. So I think it's a combination of all those things that we have to do, but we have to have a, I don't want to say a campaign to go out and, and talk to the American people because that's not appropriate. But we have to come up with better ideas on how to integrate it across a, a wider spectrum of the American population. And it's a very difficult problem. Very difficult problem. Right over here. Sir, thank you for coming this evening. Second Lieutenant Catherine Sutoff, uh, United States Marine Corps. I'm a second year master's candidate in the Regional Studies East Asia program here. Um, so I'm particularly concerned with China. And you spoke earlier about the complex and changing environment in Asia. I was wondering if you could speak to the potential of reopening military to military relations with China, um, the challenges that would be involved in that, but also perhaps the benefits. Well, first off, we are absolutely open to doing that, and we're trying to do that. China is resisting that now. Why, why are they resisting it? Because it's not to their advantage right now. Uh, what, what they are trying to do is they want to reestablish themselves. They are reestablishing themselves in the Pacific Rim and other areas in the Pacific. They want to do that individually as their own entity. And they want to actually play off the United States in order to attempt to do this. So I think that's in many ways why we're not seeing them want to do mill-to-mill -mill relationships. But that doesn't mean we should stop trying to build mill-to-mill -mill relationships. The other thing we have to do is we have to do a better job of engaging with the other Asian nations. Uh, you know, because of other things we've been doing, we might not have been engaging with all of these countries the way we would like. But the, but the, the trend that bothers me, and I saw it written about last week, is what... What China is doing is they're engaging on an economic front. And they continually allow the U.S. to engage from a security perspective. So 
What's bad about that is they're trying to gain all the resources and investment out of these countries, so and let the United States spend the money to provide security for these nations. So what we have to do is we have to bring together the economic and security together with all these nations in Asia and develop both an economic and security relationship. And as we do that, I believe over time, China will then say it's in our best interest to develop stronger mill-to-mill -mill relationships with, China, with the United States. So, so it, it's about influence and, and make sure they understand that we're going to be involved there. We are now, but we have to increase that a bit as we move forward. Right up here. Uh, thank you, General, for being here. Uh, my name is Saki Wakar. I'm uh, a first year at the business school. Uh, I'm originally from Pakistan, and uh, I have a question about the long-standing relationships that you talked about. Uh, the U.S. and Pakistan have had a long-standing relationship, uh, but there, it, it, there's a lot of mistrust and uh, different objectives. How do you think, uh, going forward, uh, though that trust is going to be won over on both sides, yeah. and the objectives uh, become aligned over the long run? Yeah, one of the problems we have with uh, with our Mis the mistrust with Pakistan goes back to, if I, let me just compare it to Egypt here for a minute, is what helped us is we had strong military to military relationships and have had strong military -mil relationships with Egypt for a very long time. Unfortunately, with Pakistan, we broke it off for about 20 years. And so breaking off those relationships has caused this mistrust that you talk about because we have not been readily talking between each other as military leaders. Uh, for a long time, so we haven't built up the relationships and the trust necessary to deal with the very difficult issues that surround Pakistan and issues that relate to the United States as well. So we're now trying to recover quickly from that over these last several years. We've made some progress, but again, it's about us understanding what our objectives are. It's about understanding what the Pakistani objectives are. It's about working together to achieve those objectives that are common to both of us and trying to gain more common objectives between us so we can then work those objectives together. In terms of trust, it just takes time. It takes time for to work through very difficult problems and issues together where you build individual trust and the individual say, I believe what they're telling me, they are good partners, that we can work these very tough issues together and I know I can rely on them. And that takes time. So we have to constantly do that while we're trying to find these common objectives that we have with each other. Um, very, very tough, very tough issues. Uh, you know, Pakistan, very important country. Uh, and, it, and it's one that we have to have strong relationships with as we move forward. And there's many issues, you know, and as you well probably know better than I do, you know, not only with what we're doing in Afghanistan and the Taliban, but with India and other countries as well. So all of that's gonna play in this as we move forward. Okay, we just have time for two more questions. I'm going to take both of you because I know you've been waiting a long time. Good evening, sir. Uh, Dan Savage, first year candidate at, uh, in the master's program here at the Kennedy School. Um, I'm also a veteran. Uh, during my military service, I, I served in uh, Bright Star in Egypt. So you've already touched a little bit on my question, but um, to what extent do you think that our relationship with their, our mill to mill relationship influenced the outcome of that conflict? And with the other uh, countries in the region that we don't have such long-standing ties with, do you think that our military can have any influence in, in their actions? Yeah. I'm not sure we had significant influence on the outcome. What we did have influence was the actions the military took. Let me explain myself a little bit. Is the constant educational process that's gone on between us and the Egyptian military, the fact that they send many of their senior officers to school here, both uh, civilian and military schools, they understand our beliefs and how our military works with the civilian government and that we protect the Constitution and protect the people. So I think that played a bit of a role, and they, they took that role on as they worked through these very difficult issues. And I think that they understood that they had to be somewhat neutral, but always have the concern of the people at heart as they move forward. And I think, for me, that's because of this long-term relationship that we've had. And oh, by the way, we were able to maintain contact with them, talk with them, discuss the problems, not tell them what to do, but be there as somebody who they can talk with and discuss these issues. And I think that was played an important role as they walked through this. Now, you had, what was the second part? Uh, just the countries that we don't, we yeah. don't have such long-standing relationships with, yeah. do you think that our military can influence their militaries at all? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to what I found is you have to get on the ground and you have to build relationships and you have to build trust. That takes time. So what we have to do is we have to select those we believe are in our best, most national interest 
We have to focus on building those strong relationships across many different areas of the world that we think are, are applicable. And we're, we're attempting to do that. We're learning more how to do that. And I think as we look to the future here, we're looking more and more to do those kind of things on how we can use the military to do that. Because in many countries, the military is, some it's, it's something that's feared, others it represents, the, the, it'll represent their country. So we have to work with both of those kind of elements to try to either change the thought process, improve their ability to work within the constraints of their own constitution and for their people. And, and I think those strong relationships help us in doing that. So, Thank you. so I'll have to be the last question. Uh, good evening, General. Natalie Fabe. I'm a first year candidate for the Master in Public Policy program. Um, I'm just wondering, generally, how, if at all, do you see the nature of the way that we project power throughout the world changing? And specifically, I'm wondering whether um, you anticipate any significant contraction in our reach, uh, given what you spoke about earlier, the economic concerns, um, your thoughts going forward. Yeah, I think if, if you've noticed, Secretary Gates has given a couple speeches the last couple of weeks, one at West Point, and one at the Air Force Academy, which has gotten everybody thinking a little bit, a little concerned in some areas because he talked about uh, how we'll use uh, military in the future. And I think what we have to do is challenge ourselves to find more ways to use our military in a more effective and efficient way as we look ahead in this new world. And I can't give you a specific examples yet of how we're going to do this, but that's the kind of thought process that we have to go through. Because the you know, what he talked about is, Secretary Gates said, uh, you know, a, land, a large land war between two large armies is something that he doesn't foresee, he said in different terms, but he said, I don't foresee it. And I think that we all are kind of going towards that idea that, so we have to figure out how do we remold our military in order to provide the president this variety of tools I talk about that enables him to operate along a spectrum of policy and and spectrum of conflict from training and advising forces to engagement to uh, assisting them to uh, use their, uh, uh, fix their problems to us actually getting involved. And, and we have to increase that array of answers that we have that we can be done with less cost but be just as effective. And that's the challenge that we have to look for. We have to do this. And how we go about doing it is going to be critical. And it'll be really difficult decisions. A lot of it has to do with we had some questions on technology. You know, are we going to spend billions and billions on technology that we might need, or are we going to kind of do some of it so we maintain this edge in case we ever have to use it and use it as a deterrent? Or how much do we use to do other avenues in order for us to increase uh, our engagements across the the world. And that, that's the discussions that we have to have and we're going to have over the next couple of years as the economy and the amount of money available to us probably changes. And that's a very, very hard question. That's, that's a question where I challenge you all to come up with ideas on how we can do this and help us to think through these problems. We do listen to you all as you write and, and, and do things. It, 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 you help stimulate us in thinking of new ways to, to move forward. So. General, I, I thank you very much. I wanted to know if you wanted to say any last words of advice. You have before you a large number of people who aspire to leadership comparable to yours. Um, some even might aspire to be your boss. Um, and uh, so I wonder whether there's I'll any... be retired by then, <laughs> but you'll still be my boss. Uh, no, I would just say um, I encourage you to want to lead. But please, as you be, think about becoming leaders, it's about selflessness. It's not about yourself. It's about how you contribute to the greater good. And that sounds you know, quirky, and it sounds Pollyannish in some ways, but it's absolutely true. And so I challenge you, as you look ahead, to think about how you can make a difference. What is your expertise? You have to be passionate about what you're doing. You know, I finally figured out, you know, somebody, you know, why have I stayed in for 35, almost 35 years in the military? Why have I gone as far as I have? And I think it's this passion that so, I got it somewhere. I'm not sure when I got it. But I got this passion for what I do. 
So you need this passion to push you. You need this selflessness to, to do something bigger than yourself. And then challenge, challenge the, uh, the current thoughts. Challenge the assumptions. One of the things, the hardest things I had to do is challenge my own assumptions that I found maybe were not right. And, and how do you re-challenge those assumptions? So I hope, I, I wish you the best, and I hope all of you uh, reach out and get to do the things that you want to do and you're passionate about. Because if, you, if you're passionate, you'll make a difference. So thank you. General, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here and have a good evening.